Welcome to the swing set. Climb on up. There's always a swing available. On Life on the Swing Set, the podcast, we explore ethically non-monogamous relationships, the pleasures and passions, the promise and pitfalls. We discuss all aspects of ethical non-monogamy in a fun, open, and welcoming fashion with a gleam in our eye, a bounce in our step, our hand down your pants. Ooh, sorry, got ahead of myself. We may be biased. In fact, we most certainly are. But we don't sugarcoat, and each of us speaks honestly and earnestly about our thoughts, ideas, and experiences throughout our very own Lives on the Swing set. Thanks for swinging by. It seems to happen like clockwork. Somebody cheats or gets caught in some sort of sex scandal. They have to make amends, show that they're working to fix the problem so that they can return to their normal lives. While we on the swing set happen to think that many of their normal lives might have been improved with open and honest conversations about monogamy, they so often fall back on the I'm addicted to sex trope. And failing that, I'm addicted to porn. These excuses are so widespread and are propagated by early friend to open sexual discussion, Dr. Drew, who has since descended into some sort of madness. Tonight, we're thrilled to be joined by clinical psychologist Dr. David Lay to discuss the myths of sex and porn addiction on Life on the Swings at the Podcast. I'm Cooper, and tonight I have with me... Hey, it's Dylan Strongbow Thomas. <laughs> Hi, it's Dr. Liz. It's Mike Joseph. And me, Dirty Lola. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. David Lay. Hey, thanks for having me. Please tweet along as you listen to our episode with hashtag SS Podcast. You can find us all on Twitter, Cooper S. Beckett, Dylan the Thomas, Sex Paz Psych, Real Mike Joseph, Dirty Lola, and Dr. David Lay. Right? There's nothing else to that, right? Yep, you got it. You got you got a great Twitter name that's just really just everything. It's just well, we should say it's Dr. David Lay. Dr. Just, yeah, just to make true. sure. Yeah, we, we want to make sure. Yeah, and it, it is spelled L E Y, not L A Y. With the last okay. name Lay, you know, I, I had two options: I could be a sex doctor, <laughs> or I could be a politician involved in a sex scandal. Um, I really <laughs> yes, that's true. About that, yeah. But I think you could be both. Holds, <laughs> if I, Anthony Weiner holds the title. Um, I can't compete with Carlos that, and he, he's still he's still the title. So yeah. <laughs> oh, and if Carlos you, yeah. Danger. If you like what we're doing here, or your name is Carlos Danger, <laughs> you can sign up on our Patreon page to throw us a buck or two every time we release an episode at lifeontheswingset.com slash support. Pledge now and join us in our private online chat community and get notified of live recordings like tonight. Do, do we actually want Carlos Danger as a as a sponsor? Because I mean, that would be kind of amazing, but also kind of horrifying. Honestly, I would I would like to have a talk with him about. Does he have any money to sponsor us election. after all this? Shit? Oh, I, I think he does. There's a movie out I, about him. Well, yeah, but he he's going through a, a very public, very negative divorce, and I'm pretty sure that Huma Abedin is going to be getting a very Everything? nice settlement out of that divorce. Yeah, I hope. And so. he's bankrupt now. He he got bankrupted by going to sex addiction treatment. <sighs> See the the problem was at one point it was fun, and his scandal was fun, and then it got really creepy really quickly. And if if you're going to have a sex scandal, I would prefer it be a fun one. It yeah. got sad. I mean, the poor guy, you know, clearly enjoys the attention of people impressed by his power and his connection to greatness, and yeah. then he wanted to show off his big package. Um, and he couldn't sort of separate those two. Yeah. I, I, personally, I think we need to do more training with, you know, politicians, with sports stars about how to enjoy all of the sex that gets thrown at you and not ruin your life over it. Well, wouldn't yeah. that require having healthy discussions about sex? We don't do that already. No, it's, really? It's something no. that politicians are not great at. My favorite recently was the North Carolina politician who um, said middle school kids don't need sex education because they're not really thinking about sex. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What? Uh, Lies. Yeah. And it's I, I think you have a really good point because I think that we don't talk to people about how 
relative positions of power work and how to make sure that you're not taking advantage of that. Um, you know, for us as therapists, a lot of our training in grad school talks about the power differential in the therapy relationship and what that means and how that affects things. And I think that people who are placed into these positions of power and prestige are often not given information about how to be responsible in that position. Well, also, uh, let's be real. Anthony Weiner looks a little bit like a bird. So, <laughs> oh, a little, oh, or, only listen, a little. Well, okay. So, I was trying to be nice. I was trying to be nice. But I think it, it also comes to when you have somebody who clearly, he was a nerd and a dork in high school or whatever. And, and then well, they've his got His name a, was Weiner, the Weiner, poor guy. Right. Yeah, that he, guy. He got, got picked on. So, now you're at a place of power where you're like, this power with great power comes lots of pussy. And, and why do you think and, he – exactly. Why do you right, think he yeah. became powerful? I mean, you know, yeah. look at Oz, Ozzy Osbourne going to sex addiction treatment for the love of God. I mean, that's why boys want to become rock God. But they're ignorant. But you're ignorant when you when you come from that place of having been, like, the dorky person. You don't – like, Anthony Weiner got caught because he just believed somebody really wanted to see their dick and really they were just, like, all about trying to trap him. Because you're like, I, you're not used to it. And you're just like, somebody wants to see it. Okay, I'm in. You know, that you don't have like that bullshit meter that comes with having experience and wielding that power that people who are cool from birth have. So that's also an issue. We need to teach these dorks how to fucking deal with shit. <laughs> well, I think the first part of that is letting them know that like you you can express how you feel about this stuff and it's okay like it, you know it, it's one yeah. thing to say that you are happy and healthy monogamous politician with a family and you are you know a family values candidate and all this stuff right and it's another thing to say well uh i also like to get a little a little bit of a side hustle going and then all of a sudden you have to lie to your you have to lie to everybody else and so you lie to yourself and you you cover it up and stuff and and until you start being able to have these discussions where you can say you know it's okay to like Say that you like this. It's okay to say that you want to fuck a lot of people. It's cool. Just admit it. it, it like we're not going to shame you about it. Some people shame, but you know what? They're yeah, not going to vote I, for you anyway. It's okay. Right. I think when you're in a position of power, it's so difficult to be real with yourself. Not only because you're enamored with all of this power that you've got and you want to get more of it, but because you're worried about potentially losing the power by revealing something about yourself that is not considered common. Yeah, did you guys follow the Jack Ryan election? Oh God, Chicago? yes we did. Oh yeah, we, We're from we Illinois. personally feel like swinging enabled yeah. Barack Obama to be president. Exactly. <laughs> you know, dude, I say exactly that during training. I said this is the president that swinging gave us. Yeah, yeah. and um, to give which to is give kind of a, wonderful. Can uh, would you like to give our listeners a, a quick bite-sized version <laughs> of of what happened there? Because it is um, one of our favorite stories, but we have not told it for a long time. Yeah, uh, Jack Ryan was uh, uh, running for Senate uh, against Obama, and um, Ryan, Republican, had previously been married to, I always forget her name, is it Jerry Ryan? Jerry, yeah. Yep. Yeah, seven of nine. This Gorgeous morning, Jerry uh, Ryan. Star, Star Trek. Trek. Robot, you know, uh -huh. Borg. Um, and he, he was a swinger, and he took her to some swing clubs in France. And uh, then during their divorce, and this is when it always happens, as they're fighting for custody of the kids – she throws out the, sw the swinging card and says it was non-consensual. I don't know if it was or not. Who knows? Um, and uh, that came out during the election. And everybody was scandalized because, oh, this good upstanding man liked to go watch his wife have sex with other men while he had sex with other women. Um, it is one of the examples that I often use of why it is so hard for people to own their sexuality because we, sure. we punish and shame people. We take away their kids. We take away their jobs. We send them to you know sex addiction summer camp that costs $1,000 a day and your insurance doesn't cover it because it's not a real treatment. Um, <laughs> And and we shame people for having this uh, these sexual desires that somebody somewhere has decided uh, um, are not normal or not OK. It's one of the reasons I love you guys doing the show is that it is educating more and more people that these desires that you have that everybody has been telling you are abnormal 
are not. They're, A, they're not abnormal, and B, they're not even uncommon. I mean, one of the guys I, I talked about in, in my book, The Myth of Sex Addiction, was a guy who had been married three times. And the first two wives and therapists that the first two wives took him to diagnosed him as a sex addict because this guy really wanted to be a swinger. He This was before your show, but he really, really wanted to be a swinger. And the first two wives tried it, and it didn't work, but yeah. he didn't let go of it. And they said, well, you must be addicted to sex. Well, his third wife cured him. How did she cure him? She was a fucking swinger. <laughs> and all of, us, all of a sudden, this desire was not discordant. There was not a conflict between it. Now, we can say, why was this guy marrying women that didn't live, you know, d- didn't share his values and his sexual interest? It's easy to say that. But in our society, we don't really share our sexual interest with people until we get to know them very well right and and sometimes not even then until we are desperate to tell them before something else happens because you're afraid you're going to lose them yeah or the madonna whore complex where it's like you you can't have be with somebody who would do the things that you want to do that's a separate person for you and that's a whole other can of worms so i I've, I've been having this really stressed out reaction uh, for many reasons to Donald Trump but for one specific reason and if anyone else any other politician ever behaved the way or spoke the way about sex about interacting with people about uh, had as many relationships let's take all the creepy shit out of it But if any other politician talked that way, they would not be anywhere near office. So let's, let's all take a moment and, and do our best to divorce ourselves from Donald Trump. Is it possible that there is, are, are we moving toward a point where that part, the sex part, doesn't matter as much, or is he somehow just Teflon? Um, I think if there was a sex tape and yeah. not just talk, I think if there was actual, like, think about it, there's everything. So if there was a giant Donald Trump dick picture on, on Instagram? Well, because here's the, here's the thing. When, when he... Giant might be exaggerating. Right. Um, <laughs> and, well, and I, when he I don't want to that... dick shame him. I don't, no. don't want to do Fair. that. No, no, like, he's most likely average, because most people are average. Very, very true. Like, Anthony Weiner got caught cheating. So it's not just about the dirty talk he was doing to that woman. It was that he was cheating on his wife. Right. So that was, like, one thing. With Donald Trump, it's been like, oh, he's just talking about things. But that's what men do. With Married men do that. But I think if it would have been something where there was a sex tape with, like, somebody that wasn't his wife while he was still okay. ma- it might have made a dent. Maybe. I, I, I don't think it would have. I, I gotta I don't be think honest. it would have either. Yeah. So here's the thing. Like, he rode to the to the presidency on a platform of racism and misogyny. So the fact that he talks about women like they're objects is a feature, not a bug, for the people who support him, right? He reinforces the values that people feel like they are losing, where women are subservient, where women do what you want, where women have to give you sex because you're nice to them. He is the cat. He's the the candidate of Gamergate. He's the candidate mm. of all of those factions that are regretting that women now have any sort of power. So I don't think that his talk harmed him. I think that it helped him. No, not the the talk, but I think if he would have been the part, like he filmed his own sex tape, those are things that are damaging in a different kind of way. Like he, he did an acceptable amount of misogyny. Like to be real, that kind of stuff is accepted. And we all knew that already. It's not accepted. It's the sliding scale. It's the sliding scale of being rich though. It was acceptable for him because he's rich. Right. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he never, he never acted ashamed of it. Well, that's the question right there. Is it that, yeah, is it that when, when politicians come out and, and do their apology tour and do that sad standing next to their wife tour that they think they have to do when, you know, when the Anthony Weiner thing first happened, I, I was all, we don't know what's going on in their marriage. He may have permission to do this. But what happens when you get caught? Then you have to make a decision. You know, like like we've talked about Hillary and Bill with this too. 
Do they have an open relationship? We have no idea. But if they did and this came out, she would have to behave in a certain way in order to get through it because it's about the shame and repentance. So if they weren't shamed or repenting, would you be able to get away with it? Like, like, let's say legitimate nice things. Let's say going to a swing club with everybody's full permission and enjoyment. Could you get away with it if you weren't ashamed of it? I think I you almost would. feel like it's easier to get away with cheating than it is with going to a swinger club. Because I think there, so too. Like the relationship escalator normalizes cheating as a behavior. Part of the way that we do monogamy is that cheating is understood that it's going to happen. It's when Francois me and you know former president of France died his wife and children were at the funeral and so was his mistress and the children he had with the mistress yeah. and the entire country just said eh <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, but they're, they're french yeah well and the interesting thing is France actually has lower rates of infidelity than the United States they don't treat infidelity as this horrible moral failing they treat it as Eh, it's kind of bad behavior, or maybe but we're it's not going to flip they, out about it. Maybe it's just that they don't treat infidelity as infidelity. They treat it as – or they don't treat fidelity as fidelity and infidelity as infidelity. They treat it as something that happens. Um, something that happens but isn't shamed. And, and ultimately – yeah. That's only for men. That's not for yeah. women. There's right. no one saying, well, eh, she had, a, she had an affair. Right. Meh. Yeah. It's only for men. Only men get away with that. And in the U.S., we treat it the same way because we have a word for mistress in so many different languages, and like it's a guma in, in Italian. And the whole thing is, is as long as you don't talk about it and it's a side piece and you still take care of your family, it's okay for you to fuck other people. The problem is when you get caught or you leave your family. And if you're a woman, you're just fucked no matter what you do. Right. So I'm actually hoping, if, if you don't mind, I have a question for you, Dr. David Lay. Uh, I want to get a little bit of a window into kind of the mindset of, of this whole thing, right? Because, I mean, I know it, and we live in it, and we work through it, and we shake our fists at it, but um, this thing that we call sex addicts, because, you know, like like Bill Clinton was called a sex addict, uh, too, right? So By Gerald Ford, former president. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when, when politicians talk about going to sex addiction treatment, or when uh, terrible TV psychologists diagnose somebody with sex addiction treatment, what... And when you say that, you mean Dr. Drew. <laughs> Among others. I yes. just, Among I just others. want to continue like... Swing Set's tradition of calling out how terrible Dr. Drew is. Until he decides to come on the He's show. He's a stain on we'll the profession. That, right? No, no. <laughs> He's he, a stain we'll tell him how terrible he is on the show. He so wants to join is, us okay, for that. Here's what I want to know, and here's what I want, want an answer to. What specifically is sex addiction treatment solving and how is it theoretically doing it i realize i'm putting out a lot of air quotes when i say that but what is the philosophy of this um well i mean yeah first in terms of beating up on dr drew um he invited me on his show like literally six times and canceled every time um ultimately because i just don't think he wanted to debate this issue um, <laughs> is he edging you <laughs> <apparently>. <laughs> He'll let you get um, so close to that microphone. <laughs> you know, Dylan, the, the, the history of sex addiction really kind of shows where this came from and why we have the issues that we do now is that, you know, the concept of sex addiction was born out of 12 step, you know, alcohol addiction treatment um, in the early 1980s at the same time as our country was going through the AIDS crisis. And lots and lots of people at that time were desperately afraid that their sexual desires could result in death. And even worse than that, if they were a man who wanted gay or bi sex with another man, that that could kill them and kill everybody else. And people were desperately afraid of it. The idea of sex addiction was a way where people said, look, we can treat desire for sex as though it's a craving for alcohol and drugs, and we can treat people to suppress that desire. Um, and it kind of worked. It kind of gave people some, some, some feeling of confidence. It, it let them externalize this desire and then resist it. Unfortunately, though, it connected with sexual shame because the 12-step model is inherently a religiously based model. Sure. And um, it, it, 
it, it was a model that was then infiltrated and grabbed onto by highly conservative religious moral folks who were identifying ultimately any kind of sex they didn't like as potentially addictive. And so that's why you have what we have today, which is that when, when, when people self-identify as a sex or a porn addict, they are doing so not on the basis of how much sex they have or how much porn they watch, but about the conflict that they feel inside with their sexual desires. And so it is people who grew up in religious traditions. It's people who never had any sex education, who don't understand their sexual desires, can't see them as normal can't self-manage them, who experience these desires and then tamp them down, try and hide from them, and then they explode out. You know, so like, for instance, one man that I worked with for a while, very successfully, he had been he had been diagnosed as a sex addict by his by his minister, by previous therapist, by his wife. The guy was bisexual and he was trying to live a a heterosexual life. He was trying to be monogamous. He had gotten married in the 80s because he was scared of AIDS. Mm-hmm. But now that now that AIDS is less scary, and now that homosexuality is less shamed, he was really struggling because he had these desires that he had hidden from he was really struggling to control because increasingly he was seeing them as something normal that he shouldn't have to control. Yeah. And so he came to me and we worked on not trying to make those desires go away, but trying to help him understand his bisexuality. One of the things I did with him, um, I've actually wanted to share on the show for a long time is the Klein sexual orientation grid. And it, it it's a, it's a model of sexual orientation. that's a little different. It's a little more sophisticated than the, the Kinsey scale, because it invites you to consider not just who you, to have sex with or who you actually have sex with, but who you fantasize about and who you socialize with. For instance, I, you know, I once treated a woman who had been married her entire adult life. She had only ever had sex with her husband, and it was sexually fulfilling sex. Sounds heterosexual, but throughout her entire life, she could only experience sexual arousal by fantasizing about being with a woman. Now she sounds lesbian. Which one is she? Is she heterosexual? Is mm. she lesbian? Is she bisexual because she kind of doesn't fit in either box? The nice thing about the client sexual orientation grid is that it offers the opportunity to step outside the boxes and to view our sexuality in a more sophisticated lens. That's the problem with the sex addiction model is that it treats sexuality as though it's very simple, but it's not. Sexuality is very complex. It involves intimacy. It involves socialization. It involves fantasy. It involves all of these things, some of which we don't understand, but they're human. And sex addiction treats them as though it's this very, very simple black and white kind of concept. This young, this guy that I worked with, as I increased his understanding of his sexual desires, as I increased his ability to see that he was a heteroromantic bisexual, he only loved his wife, but he was really interested in sex with men. As we gave him some of those frames to understand his sexuality, he then had better control of it. That ultimately, I think, is the better strategy than this whole sex addiction thing, because we can say lots of people feel out of control of their sexuality, but feeling out of control of your sexual desires has more to do with your lack of understanding of your sexual desires. I've had very much the similar experience. Uh, Every client I've ever had who has come to see me, who has reported that they think they might be addicted to sex or porn, has been a straight white man whose female partner, whose woman partner told them that they had that problem. And for each and every one that's come to me, the, the way that they've used porn or the way that they've used sex has not been in any way problematic in terms of their ability to function or their life. It just was causing conflict within the relationship. And because their partners shamed them for their desires, they began to internalize that problem and say, I must have this problem because my partner doesn't like what I'm doing. And so rather than it being about conversation and discussing the role that porn has in each of your lives and talking about what porn means to each of you, it became this feeling of, I must be wrong, I must be broken, I must yeah. have something wrong with me, right. because my partner says that I do. It was just strange, because I've had that feeling, or I had that feeling for a long time without having a partner. Um, there were definitely times when I, you know, considered the fact that I might be a sex addict or a porn addict or both. Um, and 
you know, I think a lot of that, as as has been said earlier, was based on guilt and growing up a certain way and, you know, being queer and being being uncomfortable with it and having these desires, not knowing what to do with them. Um, I think it's really important now um, to have communication about, you know, about sex and about porn and, and kind of normalize it in a way so that there aren't all of these people running around feeling like, holy shit, you know, something's broken, something's wrong with me, I'm addicted, when it you're really not. You just have, you know, feelings or desires that are not talked about commonly. And one of the other aspects to this that I think is really critically important is that men use sex and porn – which is masturbation. When we talk about porn, we are always talking about masturbation. When we talk about the anti-porn movements, we are really talking about movements that oppose masturbation. So I'd like to be very, very clear about that, that 95% of porn use involves masturbation. And people who oppose porn are really mostly concerned about masturbation to porn, but they can attack porn. But most men who watch porn um, or use sex use it to cope with negative emotions. Men are rarely taught how to deal with negative emotions, depression, sadness, anxiety, stress. Mm -hmm. Women, unfortunately, or fortunately, rather, I envy women for many reasons. They have boobs among, uh, amongst other things. <laughs> but women get taught how to deal with these negative feelings much more effectively than men do. And, and, and so men find that one thing, which is jerking off or having sex that makes them feel better. And it turns off some of those negative emotions. And unfortunately men can be kind of lazy when we find that one thing that works, we use it. And sometimes we overuse it. Many of the men that I see who get in trouble for porn, worry about porn um, or sex are guys who don't have any other ways for them to cope with their negative feelings, to feel better. So with those guys, what I do is I, it's fine for you to watch porn, you know, to make yourself feel better. But if you're feeling shitty at work or you're feeling shitty in church, you're probably not going to do well by watching porn. So we need to come up with some other strategies that you can use in those situations. Guys don't understand get that conversation and instead they just get told stop watching porn right. do that we're taking away the only way they have oftentimes to make themselves feel better it's the classic like suck it up right if a if a man a, if a cis man or a person who is socialized as a man is told it is experiencing a difficult emotion people will often tell them suck it up deal with it they aren't given any empathy or Be caring. They aren't taught strategies of how to cope with those things. And this is also, I think, a reason that, you know, a lot of cis straight men get the majority of their support emotionally from women. Because if they go to other cis straight men, the response they get is suck it up. So the only place for them to process or have emotions is with women, particularly partners. And oftentimes women will also end up punishing them for it and saying, why are you being so weird about this? Like, just get over it. And so it's this space of like being unable to experience those emotions in a way that is healthy and helpful. Now, Mike, let me, I think it was Mike. Let me ask you, yeah. when you were, when you were worried that maybe you were addicted to porn or addicted to sex, what do you think was going on there? I mean, you said just, just now eloquently that you can see that it had to do with your, your upbringing and your shame about your desires. Was there anything else in there? I think that was a large part of it. I think some of it was the fact that, um, you know, when I, when these feelings were the strongest was, you know, during a period of time when, you know, the AIDS crisis was, you know, sort of looming larger and it was, you know, a very frightening time. And, you know, I was worried that I was putting myself and others in danger. Um, and I was, you know, I was, you know, not to, uh, to, to bring up something that might make some people sad, but I was doing the George Michael thing and I was cruising bathrooms and, you know, doing all this stuff just, you know, to kind of get off. And it did feel like, you know, it, it felt like an addiction. I wasn't jeopardizing anything major to do that. Um, but it seemed like I was spending a lot of my free time, you know, doing it when I could have been doing something else. So it did feel like it was something unhealthy, something bad. Now, you know, I love the George Michael kind of story. I actually think there's a lot of 
power there. You know, in 1998, when he was first caught in the bathrooms in L.A., you know, he was ashamed and he came out and he said, well, you know, I, 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 I'm sad that, you know, my sexuality came out in this way. And he talked about he never used the word addiction, but he talked about feeling as though his sexual behaviors and desires were compulsive. Mm -hmm. In 2009, 10 years later, when he was caught in the bathrooms in London, um, then his response was basically back the fuck off. This is a part of gay culture. Mm hmm. And it's fascinating to me because it shows the degree of self-confidence that he gained about his understand his self, his sexuality, and the degree to which he was no longer willing to bow down to the shame that he was told to feel. And yeah, and I think I, you know, I agree with that analogy. Um, I think once I, and this is an ongoing process, accepted my sexuality and sort of began to use it as a badge of honor as opposed to, you know, a symbol of shame, um, I began to feel less like an addict. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with enjoying sex. There's nothing wrong with enjoying porn. Um, you know, it, it took me a while to sort of get in my head that that, that was fine. And I think, um, you know, once I did get that through my head, the feelings of potentially being an addict stopped, or at least they lessened. One of the things I often talk about is, you know, when people get married, the honeymoon phase, nobody calls honeymooners sex addicts. You know, they're having sex <laughs> two or three or four times a day during the first six months of their marriage because they're horny for each other. And they're so excited that now they get to have sex, you know, in, which is OK in God's eyes. Um, why is that level of high desire and almost compulsive sexuality acceptable it's because of the moral framework that it exists within and i think i think we can understand better that yeah there are times when we want to have sex and we know we shouldn't there are things there are times you know for instance uh, dan Ariely is a neuro economist i think he's at stanford and he did this marvelous study where he sent college students home with laptops that were wrapped up in plastic. And he asked the students first to answer questions on the computer. And for, it asked them questions like, you know, would you spank somebody? Would you have sex without a condom? Would you have sex with somebody you don't know, et cetera? Then he asked them to answer the same questions while they masturbated watching pornography. And guess what? When we are turned on, we are likely to do impulsive things that show poor judgment. That's part of the way we were made. Mm -hmm. That's part of the way sexuality works. Unfortunately, the sex addiction concept has grabbed onto that aspect and, and has treated it as this shameful thing that we should be afraid of, as opposed to this thing that we should understand so that we can exert better judgment. So I actually want you guys to hold that thought for a moment. When we come back, we're going to hear more from everybody here and Dr. David Lay on Life on the Swings of the Podcast. Today's episode of Life on the Swing Set is brought to you by Castle Megastore, the sex toy store that is essential for lovers. With an expansive online selection, as well as 16 brick and mortar locations. With everything you could want, from wand vibrators to harnesses, to lube and condoms, to a complete suite of BDSM equipment, including sex furniture, Castle Megastore has everything you need with one-stop shopping. If you use the promo code SWINGSET at checkout, you can save 20% on your order. That's CastleMegastore.com. Pick up a super hot harness today. Is it a super hot harness, Jim? Super hot. Yes, it's a super hot harness. I'm drinking wine now, and I'd like to not spit it out. So let's... I am drinking... Um... Apple cider with uh, whiskey. Ooh, I'm drinking bourbon. What am I drinking? I think I'm drinking water. I'm drinking oh. Strongbow. Strongbow. Which one? Mm -hmm. uh, the standard hard apple cider, gold apple. Uh, gold. Wait, Dylan, Dylan, can you say Strongbow again? I am drinking Strongbow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Strongbow. Are you touching yourself now, Mike? Is that what's happening? Perhaps. 
How many more times would he have to say it to get you there? Uh, a few. A few? Okay. <laughs> so, Dylan, you should just sprinkle in throughout the episode. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. Just see how many times you can say it without calling attention. I'll just, I'll just put a little bit between my fingers and I'll just sprinkle it on the podcast. Well, so this is totally the, the meow game, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is that the safe word version of the penis game? Uh, well, no. The meow game is where you just turn words into meow. Yeah. Oh. So, like, so our, like our job, Dylan, would be to not mention it because then we'd lose. Your job would be to not have it too called attention to it. I see. And I suppose Mike's job would be to enjoy it thoroughly and get off preferably. <laughs> <laughs> really, he has the best job of all. Yes. <laughs> Extra points if you're able to bring it in in a way that fits yes. with the conversation. If it's organic, Dylan, you get extra points. Hmm. Lately, it seems the world's on fire, and so much of that fire is directed at the rights of women. During his campaign, our president called them nasty women. And in the days and weeks since, they took that name back and made it a rally cry. We at The Swing Set wanted to have a shirt of support as well as give back. So we made the I Stand With Nasty Women shirt. Head over to standwithnastywomen.com to snag one today. And we're donating 75% of the profits directly to Planned Parenthood because they need our help now more than ever. Show your support at standwithnastywomen.com. Welcome back to Life on the Swings of the Podcast. I'm going to uh, ameliorate interruption of Dr. Liz and say, hey, Wait, Dr. Liz. what are you going to do? Please continue. Ameliorate. He's going to use an SAT word. Wow. Um, so something that I see a lot in the sex and porn addiction models, but also in like love addiction models or people who now are talking about internet addiction is this idea that any activity that triggers dopamine can be addictive. And it drives me insane. Because yeah, dopamine, the Kim Kardashian of neurotransmitters. <laughs> right? Dopamine is fucking everywhere, okay? If you like something, if it makes you feel good, you're getting some dopamine. So every time I see people citing, well, you know, watching porn triggers dopamine, and that means it's addictive. Or being on Facebook triggers dopamine, and that means it's addictive. It's my biggest pet peeve, because people so severely misunderstand the way that neurotransmitters function in the brain, and the way that addiction actually works. When we're talking about addiction, there has to be physiological dependence. We are looking at someone who has become dependent upon a substance. And Dopamine is involved in, in many addictive substances, but it is not the only factor. I'll disagree slightly, Liz, and, and, and that is just to say that I think, honestly, we, we've even grown beyond using the word addiction. You know, the uh, addiction has become this, uh, you know, in, in one of my books, I include this list of all the goddamn things that you can get addicted to from Harry Potter to lipstick to, you know, to high heels to tanning beds. And, and it's kind of ridiculous. Um, the word, you know, the word moron used to mean something. It used to have a medical clear terminology, but the med the medical field gave it up because society grabbed onto it and said, yeah, that's a great word word instead of calling somebody a dumbass i'll call them a we have to give up the word addiction and frankly actually the field of substance use treatment really has because we we recognize that the word addiction is is really just kind of a subjective kind of word that now we use for somebody who does something more than we like yeah we can instead we can talk much more sophisticatedly about what are the issues that go into this repetitive behavior whether it's swinging or skydiving or driving too fast or looking at your goddamn phone while you're driving mm -hmm. um, we can talk about those behaviors and we can help people understand why those behaviors like bad habits are hard to change without perceiving them as a brain disease or without perceiving them as this this addiction that, that is external to us. Instead, I think we can help people to have better integrity. One of the words I use a lot these days is sexual integrity to help people understand themselves. You know, if you're a person 
who is not made from monogamy, then you shouldn't get married and promise to be monogamous because it's not going to work real good for you and you're going to end up unhappy. Yeah, I agree. And I think that when we're talking about a lot of these things that people apply the word addiction to, the idea is there is some absolute standard that someone has exceeded. And it's the same as the word slut, right? Like when women call each other sluts, because it's a term that is often banding about between women as one of the most powerful insults, right? They did a research on the use of slut by college women. And what they found was that the use of the term had literally nothing to do with how much sex people had and had much more to do with uh, socioeconomic status and with their status within social circles. And I think that addiction is being used a lot of that same way, that it's a marker of status. It's a marker of who we are trying to say is not like us. It's an in-group, out-group marker more than anything else. I agree. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that I'm interested in, you know, with with this show even is – you know, folks um, who claim to be sex addicts, and, you know, and somebody in your chat room is going to is going to jump up and say, Lay is full of shit. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But somebody. <laughs> he dared folks, you, chat room. That's right. <laughs> folks who claim to be sex addicts tend to be folks from religious backgrounds, and they don't tend to be swingers or polyamorous or people in the BDSM kink community because they are people who have spent time understanding their own desires, learning how to communicate their desires and learning how to negotiate them. You know, as you said at the beginning, uh, you know, Cooper, if, if Anthony Weiner had said to his wife, you know, Hey, I really get off on sharing pics, naked pics with these other strangers. Can we negotiate that in our marriage? That would have been a very different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard for me to not occasionally get stuck in the, I feel this thing and this is why I'm broken because I had, uh, I, I spent a very long time living that way. You know, I felt things and therefore I was broken. Uh, I never really connected with the term sex addiction because nobody ever said to me, well, you're addicted to sex because I was able to very awkwardly fit uh, sex with multiple people or relationships with multiple people in my life by, you know, practicing serial monogamy, which absolutely didn't work, uh, by any measure of the term work, but, uh, it, you know, it happened and it got me by for a while. And I, I felt a lot of shame for doing that, but I didn't know how to do it a better way. And I think that one of the things that and this would be part of the show's mission statement, right? One of the things that we try really hard to do is to show people, like, listen, if you're not happy doing something, there's a way to be happier doing it, or there's a path to doing something else. You just got to spend a little bit of time and intention in getting there. And so, like, my path away from feeling that the fact that I wanted to get with all these people, uh, often at the same time, was trying to figure out why I did. And uh part of fixing that part of me was accepting that that's not such a bad thing and that there was a, like e even saying there's a difference between feeling this way and actually doing something about it was kind of like the first step in getting getting over that like okay i'm just thinking these things so i don't need to feel bad about thinking this as long as i don't do it and then i could take baby steps toward getting to the place where i could say well maybe i can actually pursue something like this and because everybody i'm with is on board with it then it's okay and now that the all those steps the, i mean that was like a 10 year process so it, uh, i can't uh i don't want to undersell how much effort it took to get from oh god everything in my head is bad and i'm bad uh because i feel that way to group sex is great but it's definitely there and showing people that you know hey maybe i can be a little bit of a an example on how to get what you want out of life uh that's that's not so bad and, and it is hard and it takes time. And sometimes there are very real losses that you face when you move towards that authenticity. You know, I exploded a marriage because monogamy was not for me. And I had promised something relatively close to monogamy, Yeah, you know, and it takes a lot to find that space of authenticity within yourself. It takes courage to move forward for them from that space of authenticity. And I think that when you're feeling fear and shame, 
it often it makes that kind of step much more challenging. And when models like sex addiction reinforce that shame and tell you that, yes, there is something wrong with you for wanting these things, it makes it almost impossible for you to step out and move forward with that authenticity. Or to know that it's a viable option. Like that's a, that's a big thing for a lot of people is that, that nobody sits and tells you that you could get married and have a discussion and end up in a marriage where you're open, poly, whatever, swinging. Nobody ever makes that a viable option. The options that are usually given are you're a cheater um, or you have a problem. Well, and, that's why visibility is so come back from important, even though it's so fucking right. simple, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's not just visibility. And I think that's a huge part of it, but it's visibility in terms of being a moral authentic, to use Liz's word, um, composed individual who has made this sexuality a thoughtful part of your life. And, you know, I think in my new book, Porn for Dicks, one of the things I ask people to do is think about what role pornography plays in your life when you're not turned on. Think about what it, you know, what you're watching porn means when you're not jerking off because that then lets you start to think about well what kind of person do i want to be you know uh, anti-porn activists you know make a big deal out of um you know guys hitting girls in the faces with their penises or coming on their faces and they code both of those things as a form of aggression in in research on pornography hmm. what i tell guys is I don't tell them, don't hit a girl in the face. Instead, I tell them, don't hit a girl in the face with your penis unless you can be a gentleman while you do so. And to do that means you have to have had a conversation with her. You have to know, does she like getting hit in the face with a penis? Does she think that's kind of sexy? If she doesn't, then don't do it. If she does think it, then you're good giving a game, and this is how you be a gentleman. So I I think that's how we move this forward. Instead of viewing sexuality as this thing that we have to be ashamed of, that we have to hide from, that we do behind closed doors with the lights off under the covers, instead we can start to view sexuality as one of the varied parts of human existence. And some people like lots of sex and some don't some people like really kinky exciting sex and some people don't some people like sex with multiple people and some people don't and we can accept ourselves on those spectra and move forward yeah i think in one of your previous podcasts liz talked about you know the the sexuality skills that she's developing to help people gain that increased level of self-acceptance and self-understanding viewing sexuality as a part of ourself that we can understand and move forward with as opposed to hiding from because when we feel shame so often we lash out and when we lash out we tend to try to drag as many people down with us as possible. And when we do that, it's, it's, you know, the, even the act of, of calling porn addiction, the reason for, uh, one of the, someone's fuck ups is actively hurting the porn community. You know, so the act of saying that, oh yeah, this, this sex addiction led me to sex workers. That's actively hurting the sex worker community. So we, we just are spewing this, uh, vileness that reinforces the idea that we should all be having polite monogamous sex behind closed doors and not wanting anything more from our lives. Which I don't believe well, and, clearly. And shame, shame also, you know, the way that shame functions is that it's a very painful emotion. It's one of the most painful emotions to experience in terms of the subjective experience of it. And so if what you're using to try to control someone's behavior is shame, you're going to lead them to use the coping strategies that they are most practiced at, which are not necessarily the most healthy or the most effective. And that's why a lot of people, when they're feeling shame about their porn use, will go and masturbate because it's what they know will give them a temporary release. Even though there may be a shame consequence that follows that as well, 
the shame is so painful and uncomfortable that they will do whatever it takes to get rid of that shame. And, and it creates a desperation that makes it more difficult to use positive coping strategies. You know, one of the, one of the things I really like is I've gotten to know people in the, in the porn industry and such is <clears throat> many of them are really wonderful people. I, mean, I can't tell you how many female porn stars I know who, um, support you know animal charities they run animal rescues uh you know jessica drake um you know supports a a homeless shelter for women in la and these are deeply kind giving people kink.com you know has a nonprofit that is connected to them you know using the 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 marching space for like community events and stuff and i think the more we can publicize that the more we can say, hey, look, here are these people who have lots and lots of sex, really exciting sex, and they're still good people. Yeah, I mean, remember Wilt Chamberlain? Wilt Chamberlain had sex allegedly with, you know, thousands of women, more than 10 or 15,000 different women. And yet he was still a good guy. And he consciously chose, he said, I don't want to get married. I wouldn't be a good husband. I think he knew he wasn't good at monogamy. He wanted that excitement. Um, I think we need more models like that so that people can choose consciously and not feel afraid of it. Um, you know, shows like this, shows like like Tristan's, you know, show, which funnily enough, I did the other night and I was I was really weirded out because I kept hearing Cooper's voice doing the announcement. <laughs> and I thought and I I'm thought, everywhere you want to be. It's okay. I, I get that voice. feeling too. <laughs> I think you know the podcast kind of stuff and the internet really, the internet is really what has created this is that the internet has democratized sexual freedom. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with more of Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. When it comes to online dating, we here at the Swing Set believe that Cassidy is the best one out there. It looks great, it's intuitive and easy to use, and it's simply full of potential sexy friends. Still the fastest growing online swinger dating site in the world, Cassidy has been our go-to site for the last three years. If you sign up using our link at lifeontheswingset.com slash K-A-S-I-D-I-E, you'll get some free time to explore the site. And you can decide for yourself if Cassidy is the site for you. Hope to see you there at Cassidy.com. If there's anything you want to uh, address specifically at any time, let us know. If you'd like to redo something, just say loudly, Dylan, cut that, and he will. We can do that? He'll no, fix you it can. in post. Yeah. yeah, he'll fix it. Sometimes he won't just for me. <laughs> it's just because he hates you, Cooper. Yeah, you know. Stop no, it, we, we talked about this. We love each other. We've been spackling the cracks. It's cool. Um, <laughs> that sounded a little years. dirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really dirty, spackling in the crack. Right? <laughs> Were you guys ever too Is that like I when you jizz down their head. butt crack? Is Jeez, that what uh, that is? Where face? your cum just drips down the butt crack? <laughs> the face that. So is that, is that like a legitimate new sex act that we have created <laughs> okay. here? Well, now there has to be porn of it because now that we've talked about it, it there, exists. We've, we've birthed it. All that I'm is just like, come on somebody's maybe... ass, you just wipe your dick up and down it. That's spackling the crack. That's what that is. <laughs> huh. It could be a flesh dick, it could be a silicone dick, whatever. After there's come on the butt, you just spackle the crack. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds so confident. I'm, she does. I'm sound very confident about it. <laughs> Holy crap. I am inclined to believe her. <laughs> I am too. And even if I didn't, I would vote in her favor. Dashes quickly to Urban Dictionary. <laughs> yes, own that ship. We all come to a point in our lives when we finally ask the ever-looming question, is this all there is? And most of us coast along afterwards, just accepting that the answer to that question is probably, yeah, this is it. Sometimes, though, we're lucky. Sometimes we run into the right people at the right time. 
the young couple at the center of a lifeless monogamous. The new novel by Cooper S. Beckett are about to meet a couple of swingers, and this moment will change their lives. Cooper's first novel is already receiving acclaim, and you can pick it up today, direct from the author at lifelessmonogamous.com, as a signed paperback, DRM-free ebook, or audiobook, read by Cooper himself and me, Kat Stark. Use promo code SWINGSET at checkout to save 10%. You can also get Cooper's memoir, My Life on the Swing Set, Adventures in Swinging and Polyamory, as an ebook, signed paperback, or audiobook at mylifeontheswingset.com. Enjoy more Cooper today in book form. And we're back. Welcome back to Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Help me out. Who did the and we're back thing? Because that sounds real familiar. Oh, lots of lots of uh, radio people. Lot, I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty common broadcast. Oh, it's a trope. Thing. Okay, but it's you should trope. say "Welcome back, Cotter." Come on, man. Welcome back. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. Sing that song. <laughs> Up your nose with a rubber hose. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to do it. Up all of your noses, listeners. And Horshack looks like Anthony Weiner, so we're just. Oh like, boy. Full wow, wow. Taking, it, taking it full circle. <laughs> Lola with the win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Now now I've got this image of him in his underwear in my head. <sighs> Thanks a lot. Well, and does he have a, a large and, and lens-focused package? He is rocking some knock. Fun fact, <laughs> yeah. I, I saw Anthony Weiner in the streets, like at the peak of when <laughs> things were getting really creepy. Yeah, he he was. It was in the summertime. He had on a dirty white t shirt, like dirt. It was like dingy, cut off shorts that were just about too short. Is he a never nude? And he just was sweating so much, and it was such to the. I was like, it can't be him. As he was quickly walking towards me, but as he got closer, it was definitely him. <laughs> and I just. I couldn't do anything, and I just was like, I whispered, Carlos, because it was just, <laughs> it was this very surreal, oh, man. like, moment. Oh, you did not. I didn't did he, say Did he it turn loud around, enough. and did you see him poke out at the bottom of his uh, head? <laughs> I don't think I said it loud enough, but it was a, a, it was a loud whisper, but I don't think I said it loud enough for him, and uh, I was such in shock no, he likes that to it hear was it actually shouted. him. Yeah. I was just like, Carlos. Close? It was a question because it oh, was man. so he he just looked like he had been doing construction in yeah. the eighties. Like it wasn't. <laughs> now I have YMCA stuck people. in my head. That's what he. I mean, but it was like he, a, a he'd been doing fake white construction T-shirt in the 80s. and like short cut off shorts, and it was just very odd. It's just if I was having a scandal, I wouldn't be outside. Like that. Yeah, if you're doing construction in short, you got to wear a neat. Mm-hmm. And if we think of Anthony Weiner in knee pads, now we're going somewhere else. Oh, you know, the you nice thing write. about being involved in roller derby is that I have awesome knee pads. <laughs> hey, my daughter doesn't does roller derby. Oh, that's awesome! Very cool. I love the I love the empowerment of it, uh, the the celebration of it, even a female aggression. You, you know, I think I think the more we acknowledge these darker desires that we have in ourselves. I think the more um, understanding and the more control we have of them. Um, you know, one of the things I do is uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I have a black belt and and, and, and doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I get to work out with some of the top MMA and UFC fighters in the world. And it, it's really exciting. But the funny thing is the more um, control I gain in, in engaging in that grappling sport, the less I want to hit people during my daily life. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's what we were talking about earlier a little bit. It's, it's a release valve on things that would otherwise build up until they explode. I think that's the biggest problem with repressing desires is you can, assuming it's not a terribly important desire, repress it for a good long time. But there will come a day when you can no longer repress it. And usually when it gets to that point, it becomes a big thing rather than a little thing. And it comes out in a negative yeah. way as opposed to you know a positive or productive kind of way. Because you can rarely control it at that point, too. 
So for those listeners, uh, you know, those folks that are listening to your show yes. who are who want that help but are struggling with this, how do they get that? Um, you know, how do they find somebody who is going to help them with this dilemma and not tell them that they should just repress it or suppress it or should be ashamed of it? So what I recommend <laughs> to folks is, um, you know, first, of course, buy my books because, you know, my yes. books will help you. They will take care of you. You know, once you got my book, you're all good to go. But really, instead, you know, it, it was fun in my in my last book, um, Ethical Born for Dicks, I got to include this list of people who are exploring these ideas. And um, I got to recommend, you know, if you're struggling with these issues, you can look for counselors that are ASEC certified, which is the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists, which is an association that just came out about four weeks ago and said sex addiction is not real. Um, gave me like a huge literary orgasm because for years I've been the only guy that was saying this. And, and I was told I was crazy. Um, they, you know, they threatened to sue me. David Duchovny from X Files threatened to sue me because every what? time, the newspaper, every time the newspapers ran a story about my uh, opposition to sex addiction, the newspaper would run a picture of David Duchovny. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. And, and that's your fault. How? <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so Duchovny's lawyer said, look, stop talking about Duchovny. And I said, dude, I'm not, you know, talk to the newspaper, man. Talk to the New York Times. You know, um, if Duchovny doesn't want people want to be known for his sex addiction, he should stop uh, claiming he's addicted to sex. That's right. Word. Um, but so ASECT came out and supported the idea that sex addiction is not real, that it's a shaming concept and that it's not based on good sexuality information. It's not based upon an understanding of the diversity of, of human sexuality. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of ASECT trained therapists. And so I also tell people to find a therapist who specializes in work with the LGBT population, because guess what? Therapists who are more accepting of sexual orientation, diversity, of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender kind of expressions are less inclined to shame you for your sexual desires, no matter how strange you may think they are. Yeah. I think all uh, therapists should be sex positive. You would think, but, you know, one in, thing in an ideal world. Do, but yeah. yeah. I do trainings around the country and fewer than five to 10% of mental health therapists in our country have training in sexuality. Let I that was, sink in yeah. for a minute. 90% of therapists out there, all they know about sex is what they do and what yeah. they saw on TV last night. And, you know, Kinsey said it best. The definition of an infomaniac, a sex addict in today's world is anybody who has more sex than the therapist. <laughs> so if you're getting laid more than your therapist, is going to tell you there's something <laughs> fucking wrong with you. Yeah. I, I may have a long search in therapists. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Ha -ha. I was really, really fortunate to, to <laughs> come into contact with a therapist uh, when I was living in Boston who really, really helped me come to terms with, uh, you know, not only my sexuality, but um, being polyamorous. I mean, I'm incredibly grateful to him because I think if I hadn't come into contact with him, uh, things would be a lot different uh, now. So, I mean, I, I will completely co-sign the fact that it is really, really important to uh, have a therapist that is sex positive. When the great thing about it is, as as more people ask for sex positivity in their uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, in their doctors, their general practitioners, there will clearly be more of a demand for it and they will have a harder and harder time pretending it doesn't matter. Well, you know, I think Obama gave us this. I mean, Obamacare led to, you know, more people having mental health coverage for their health insurance. Mm -hmm. And so those folks didn't want to pay cash for sex addiction treatment from a therapist when their insurance should pay for it. 
Because right. sex addiction treatment isn't covered by insurance because it's not a real diagnosis. Your insurance won't pay for it. So so people then went to real therapists and then were surprised that the therapist didn't know anything about sex. Um, there was this a marvelous study just a few months ago by a, a guy named Christian Joyal um, up in Canada, J-O-Y-A-L. And he published this remarkable remarkable study where they reached out to people in Quebec and um, they asked them how many of them, this was just a random sample. This was a phone call, like one of those surveys you get. And they asked people, are you interested in things like exhibitionism or frauderism, which is rubbing up against people uh, non-consensually, unfortunately, um, uh, voyeurism, all these things that mental health views as sexual disorders. Mm -hmm. 50% of the population, 50% were interested in these things, and 30% of them had engaged in them, including polyamorous or open relationships. And it forces the mental health industry to recognize that these things that we thought were uncommon and unhealthy are neither. Now, therapists are being forced to realize, holy shit, I've got a whole lot of people on my caseload who are some kinky fuckers, yeah. and I don't know how to treat them. They're now coming to people like me, people like Liz, people like ASEC and saying, wow, we need better training to treat this because we didn't know this stuff was out there as popular as it is. I mean, recent studies showed 50 percent of millennials view monogamy as kind of optional. That's really extraordinary because that and pornography are generational issues. I mean, you know, the a, a, again, a research recently came out from the uh, from some. Christian groups that identified that young um, young Christian uh, teens view not recycling as more sinful than watching pornography. Now, I view <laughs> that as really kind of awesome because those kids are going to save the goddamn planet. Mm -hmm. They don't give a shit about pornography. But the old farts are sitting there going, wow, we got we got to make sure these kids understand how bad pornography is. What that means is that in 20 years, this issue won't matter. We've just got to get there. Yeah. Alan, watching the last gasp of that is terrifying. Well, yeah. I mean, it's scary and it's because you don't want to get drowned. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Where can they get your books and hear more from you? Yeah, so I'm like all over the country. If, if your people want to, you know, if your folks want to hear me, I mean, I'm, a, I'm on Tristan's show. I do, I do lots. Of That's a great way to connect with people. Um, I'm on Twitter at Dr. David Lay, and all of my books um, are on Amazon. Um, Insatiable Wives, which we didn't even talk about, but it's all about cuckolding and hot wives, um, and uh, which is the only book my of, of my books that my wife really likes. She, she she thinks that book about female sexuality is really good. My my second book, The Myth of Sex Addiction and Ethical Porn for Dicks, my wife likes, but she thinks they're a little too too angry. Um, <laughs> Insatiable Wives was it was just me kind of awestruck by the by the insatiable sexuality of these women and their husbands who said, yeah, let's do it. Well, that's awesome. We, we should have you back for cuckolding. <laughs> oh, that would be a fun uh, show. That sounds strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there going to be cuckolding like on the show? On actual, you know, that shouldn't be a problem. We're going we're gonna to have the show, and then we're not going to actually talk about anything. So we're just going to... We're just going to all sit around and we're going to be cuckolding our audience. No, no. I, you know, I disagree. Listen, listen. No, no, no. The, you, we're all going to have a discussion and, and we're doing it because I'm saying it. Uh, I have declared it, right? But what's going to happen is uh, my wife is going to find somebody to bring home and they are going to fuck on the bed next to me oh. while I podcast. Thereby, Why will you do the show? Whoa. Holy shit. And the thing is, usually, usually I would be, this is not a cuckolding thing. This would be like, oh, I'm enthusiastic about this. I'm helping out all sorts of, uh -huh. no, no, no. This is, they are going to be shaming me. They're going to assault my manhood while I'm on the wow. podcast. They are going to, we're going to do the full couple of the experience. I, I, I'm I into this. This off. is going to be really wow. turned on. I got to be yeah. honest. I sign yeah, off just, fully on this. Now, yeah, whatever no. you do, don't get out a gun. I actually, <laughs> in the book, I, I, I talk about one case gone wrong where a couple picked up a young guy at a bar, 
Uh-huh. Took him home. The guy, the husband sat in a chair next to the bed, watched the young guy have sex with the wife. And then the wife got up, went to the bathroom. The husband pulled out a gun and shot the young guy in the back. So Whoa. please don't do that during the show. Whoa. No, Dylan, don't do that. Yeah, That's I can guarantee you. <laughs> dark all of a sudden. I can guarantee you that the only gun that will be in my hand may be my cock. <laughs> I think so we, I, were, what, was that, what was that from Full Metal Jacket? This is my weapon. This is my gun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is my rifle. This is my gun. This is for fighting. This is for fun. Yeah, nice. There you go. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> so before uh, before we before we take this to the outro, Coop, do you mind if I read another review? Oh, oh yes, go ahead. It read another review. Like that kind of thing. You do. I do. And so far, we are. Uh, Two for three for no incidents of reading reviews uh, over the last ten podcasts. So we're we're, we're I still I, I still don't actively remember what it was that happened. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. <laughs> All right. So have I uh, repressed it? Was it that bad? It I don't possible. remember it either, Cooper. So maybe. I remember Dylan feeling very sheepish, but that's died, all I've got. It died along with the rest of 2016. So this review is titled Amazing, and it's a five-star review. I love this podcast. I've been listening since 2011, and I always look forward to hearing what the group has to say each week. I love that everyone is so open about their personal lives, as that's what really makes this podcast fun to listen to. You really get to know the hosts, and you become personally invested. The topics are both interesting and informative, and the banter and very obvious affection aww, between the hosts is really what makes this podcast unique. I get to laugh and learn at the same time. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. So yeah, thank you, reviewer. I appreciate that. Thanks for giving us what we asked for. <laughs> And we're not just asking for five-star reviews. We really legitimately want any reviews you've got. Yeah. And, you know, just... We'd, we'd, re- we'd read a one-star review just so as not to make, like, liars of ourselves here. But, but we'd show. really like to not have to. I mean, yeah. Don't, I mean, don't, don't just do it because you're being clever. Don't, don't dill in it. Yeah. You know, give us one if you, if you feel we deserve it. Like, listen, if you have to, you can go ahead and say, you know, Dylan doesn't know what he's talking about, and then leave it at that. That's okay. I can deal with that. <laughs> Just make it five stars. <laughs> so, so, Dr. David Lay, where can we... Oh, no, you no we, we already did I'm that, Dylan. Dylan. No, you go ahead and do your job, Cooper. Do your damn job! Let's, let's, ask, let's ask Dirty Lola <laughs> about no. Sex at a Go-Go dirty and... Lola. Her sexy shenanigans. <laughs> or the second most dirty Lola. Pussy Posse! Who is, who is yeah. the dirtiest Lola if not her? You don't want to know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't okay. know. I'd like to meet her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so Sex at a Go-Go. Um, we have two lovely episodes right now that are newish because of a, a mistake we made, whatever. <laughs> 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 that, that you it should happens. listen to. It happens. That you should listen to because we are still on hiatus until the end of February. And when we come back, it's going to be kick ass. And yeah, but you have to wait. You have to wait. So you're just going to have to deal with what's up on the site and now. What what website should they <laughs> go to for that? Oh, yeah. Yours. Said, <laughs> been. Don't go to mine right now because I'm working on it. It's oh, okay. Like, so I, it's I was being uh, worked on. That, no, I'm yeah. trying not to steer people that way while we're while it's being worked on just in case. But if this airs like... In two months, then you can go to sexatagogo.com. But so yeah, wait till wait till March. Yeah, wait till, till March. So you're like, go check it out because it's that's, under construction. Or to be that's safe a good switch. way to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't want them to go there and they're like, "What the fuck, Lola?" Yeah. <laughs> Why does you say dream scared post? me here. <laughs> Lola and I got to do a presentation together a couple months ago while Liz watched. It was very exciting. <laughs> we did. That's, we that did. sounds <laughs> filthy. Mm. We were on a yeah. keynote panel together. I did. I watched them get super hot and intellectual <laughs> together. I did. <laughs> and Jizzly was um, between us, so that made uh-huh. it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was Indeed. Uh-huh. I'm getting hot now. Uh, and, and actually, in all seriousness, um, I, I, 2016 was not my best year to be out in the world. And so, uh, Dr. David... Oh, see, I need to call you David. That's right. David. David. I think he might... He, he, Dr. David. You, that's, that's Dylan, sexy. you can call me Dr. Oh. David. There you go. Dr. David, thank you. I, I, I got to wrap my head around that now. He's feeling Dr. shame. David. He has an addiction to calling people doc. No, it's it's not a shame thing. It's just I, I like titles. So uh, I hadn't read anything of yours 
uh, until I saw you on that panel. And so I then did a, a little bit of, you know, research and I'm like, Hey, why didn't I notice this person many, many years ago? And so uh, I, I'm glad that we've pr- started to rectify that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, I've been doing this for a few years, but you know, the, the industry, the community, the dialogue is, is changing. It's becoming more out there. I think it's becoming more accessible. And, and again, I mean, I'm really not kissing your ass or sucking your dick when I say, you know, that even yours, Lola, um, I will suck your dick on this show. Um, the, the, Damn. The, right. What you guys are doing, I, I swear to God, it's important. Because, you know, that review, again, I mean, one of the nice things in that review is that they talked about how, how open you guys were about who you are as people. And I think the more we do that, the more we can identify, hey, there are kinky, highly sexual people out there who are still good people. That's the exact same thing as what happened that led to the gay marriage movement and led to, you know, LGBT equality. And as more gay people came out, forcing the rest of society to say, oh, you know what? These people are just like us. So what? They don't like sex the way I do. I think the more we can change that, and you called it visibility, and I kind of poo-pooed that, but I think that that, that that really is important. The more you give role models to people, one of the questions I ask you know, lots of people is, who is your sexual role model? You know, who would you like to be sexually? Not just like John Holmes, but who would you, you know, what kind of life would you like to live where sexuality is a part of it, where you accept that aspect of yourself. Few people can answer that question, but I got to tell you, I think people that li- listen to this podcast probably have some answers. Well, I'll definitely tell you that uh, over the, God, seven, almost seven years we've been doing this thing, uh, two things really sustained me when nothing else did. Uh, number one, it was the fact that uh, we were doing something that even though I didn't always believe that what I was doing was important, that was actually important. And, uh, and number two, we've been, uh, I've been personally really fortunate to get a lot of really nice feedback, not always publicly, but, uh, definitely heartfelt. And so, you know, every, every little bit helps and it's, it's really nice. Yeah. I don't make a lot of money off my books, but I make incredible soul credit that I hope will get me into heaven from you know making up for all the other shit i do Um, (laughs) with 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 people who who write to me and say hey your writing your books made me feel better help me understand myself help me accept myself and the really exciting things you know is when you know people write and say wow i had really amazing sex last night and it's because of you should we send you those text messages when that happens hey (laughs) holy crap i frame those things (laughs) Well, thank you very much for those the kind words, yeah. Yeah, well, we were very happy to finally uh, get this lined up for you. Liz. Yes. Where can we find you online? Sexpositivepsych.com. I also have a YouTube channel, Sex Positive Psych. have lots of fun videos on there. Um, I think I'm putting up one today, which will be out before you see it about whether you should fuck first or wait. It's a great question. It is. And Mike. Oh, hey. Tell us about your radio show. (laughs) I'll tell you about my radio show. It's called the Jerry Crow Chronicles. It's on Radio Free Brooklyn, uh, RadioFreeBrooklyn.com, or you can download the TuneIn app and uh, listen to it on Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or you can wait a couple of days uh, when I post it on Mixcloud, <laughs> and it can be streamed at any time. Um, the good thing about listening live is that you get to hear me make mistakes. Uh, yeah, that's that's like our <laughs> listeners are, are enjoying. Enjoying? Enjoying. In with quotes. air quotes. Very large enjoying. air quotes. <laughs> Politely uh, sticking around for. Yes, by the time the show gets to Mixcloud on Mondays, all of the rough edges have been sanded off. <laughs> so, so if you want uh, sort of nervous or frenzied or 
you know, whatever mistake laden Mike Joseph, which can be fun. Yes. Then you listen live on Wednesdays. If you want the cleaned up, slightly less nervous or anxious version, then you listen on Mondays. Or whenever, because you can stream it and you can listen to it whenever you want. It's perpetuity. <laughs> and you can follow me on Twitter at Real Mike Joseph, where I'm just as nervous and awkward. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash The Swing Set. Find us on Twitter at Cooper S. Beckett, Dylan the Thomas, Sex Paws Psych, Real Mike Joseph, Dirty Lola, and wow, I, I totally forgot to remove. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you still have Sheer Cats on there? No, I get thrown off whenever anything is not what I expect it to be in the in the outro. Only in the outro. At, sex at cool. dirty, yeah, in, in well, in in sex and in life. At Dirty Lola and at Doctor David Lay. Now I lost the outro. Where is it? As well <laughs> as our site at On the Swing Set and at Swing Set <laughs> FM. Speaking of making mistakes. What, what was that? See, they're Speaking. listening. They're listening to the mistakes right now. It's all happening. Speaking it's, of, it's they're getting real. them. This is real. This is real life. Really, listeners, this is what you pay for when you subscribe to our Patreon. Yes, this, this is authenticity. Yeah, this, your, your, your Patreon dollars at work here. Messy is so much sexier than perfect. <laughs> You can discuss our latest podcasts and other topics on Twitter at hashtag SS Podcast and on our episode posts on our website at lifeontheswingset.com, where you can also find daily blogs, articles, and toy reviews, as well as sign up for our mailing list at lifeontheswingset.com slash list. Give us a call and leave us a voicemail with questions, comments, or reviews at 573-55-SWING. That's 573-557-9464. Visit our Patreon page as we mentioned, to throw us some money so you can listen to us make stupid mistakes that you may <laughs> be able to listen to when the show is released because Dylan likes to leave those in, but you may not, and you'll never know unless you come on and listen. And it's only $3 uh, pledge level to join us for the live podcast. So, you know, there, there are, I'm, I've been a shill, a shill. But you should do it at lifeontheswingset.com slash support. Speaking of shilling, you can buy my novel about swinging, A Life Less Monogamous, or my memoir, My Life on the Swing Set, Adventures in Swinging and Polyamory, as an oh, e-book. Really, you know, we'll take a penny farthing. It doesn't have to be a full show. Or <laughs> a penny farthing. <laughs> or audiobook. And if you buy them from cooperspecket.com, use promo code SWINGSET to save 10%. Want a big, uh, another big thanks to Dr. David Lay for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. And Dr. yes, Dr. he did offer to suck Lola's dick. <laughs> and yes, <laughs> Dylan did promise to be cuckolded on the air on a future episode. Oh, that's so hot. And I really think we should give the give your wife and the person um who's fucking her their own recorder <laughs> so you can put whatever actual audio you know should be in the recording uh -huh. but you know we want to mic them well dylan because we're all going to want to hear what they have to say I, I think i think that we could make that a uh, a patron reward oh that sounds good yeah. yes they, they get <laughs> they get that audio yeah. dylan that's brilliant and if it's a guy named mike who is Wife, then we're miking Mike while he's miking his wife. Did I just get volunteered into you this? You did, you did. I hope you're ready. Dude, it's pretty clear you volunteered yourself. <laughs> well, my wife does have pretty spectacular boobs, so Mike. She uh, does. I do like boobs. Agreed. Mm -hmm. well, Can I well. offer things so people will do the Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. It's snowballing, yes. <laughs> That is not something I need more than three dollars for snowballing. I can't. I, can't I think that's $3. reasonable. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Listeners, I'm just gonna go ahead and say thanks, thanks for, for swinging, swinging by. by. <laughs> Out of control. <laughs> Oh,
Hi, I'm Ruby Ryder from PeggingParadise.com and Pegging101.com, and you're listening to a Swing Set Network podcast at SwingSet.fm. Have a sexy business? Love the swing set? Let's put these two great things together. The Swing Set Network has advertising and sponsorship packages available for our websites and podcasts. Email advertising at lifeontheswingset.com for more information. Thanks. And we have a listening audience that can't talk. Gotcha. <laughs> they, they can, can only type. type. They can <laughs> type. Rip their larynxes out. They can t- <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, we didn't rip out their larynxes. We just cut out their tongues. We're not barbarians. <laughs> yeah. No, fair. I'm so glad that we are taking this yeah. as soon as I thought we might. It's like, man, Dylan's talking about hard cider a lot this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really have anything to do with the show. They must have sponsored it. <laughs> <sighs> But then you'll make all the other podcasts jealous, Dylan, because they'll wonder how you got Strongbow to sponsor the episode. <laughs> well, you know, like like another podcast I like very much, all I do is I pretend that they sponsor me, and then eventually they'll actually start giving us money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 